The substance which is Christ living within us. I've been a Christian for over 50 years. I just figured that out a few moments ago. This sermon is for me. So if you've been a Christian for 50 years, you need to hear this sermon. If you've been a Christian for 60 years, you need to hear this sermon. If you've only been a Christian for five years, you need to hear this Christian. If you've been a Christian for five minutes, you need to hear this. Because we're in a war. We're waging a battle. And I'm afraid in my life, and I'm going to guess it's probably true in your life, that all too often... The world wins more of that battle than Christ does. Because intellectually we know the substance belongs to Christ, but realistically we look at this world and we say, Oh my, I need that. I need something that this world has to offer. And we're overwhelmed with it. And we get into a major problem of being consumed by the superficial. Being concerned with the obvious, the apparent, the shallow, that which is on the surface. That which the Bible says is very temporary. I had a man visit me recently. Is it on now? <laughs> Technology, the superficial wins another battle. <laughs> but I'm telling you, it does not win the war. Had a man visiting with me recently, I think that's where I was. <laughs> And he was very, very concerned about something going on in his life. And after he had poured out his heart for about 40 minutes to me, I shocked him. I said, it sounds to me like you're consumed with the here and the now and you aren't looking at the overall picture of how your life ought to be in Christ Jesus. And he just kind of, with a long face, looked at me for a moment. I said, in other words, I'm telling you, you've made a mountain out of a molehill. You're letting something that is so superficial rule in your life. Something that is so temporal overcome you. 
And what you really need to be looking at is that which is eternal, that which is spiritual, that which is found in the newness of life that God wants us to have. It's a major battle. Superficial hinders a lot of us from the ability to make substantial change in our lives, the change that's going to make a major difference in our lives. And I'm here to tell you that this affects people who are very old in Christ as well as it affects people who are very young in Christ. So we get to worrying about the color of our hair. We get to worrying about the, the freshness of our clothes. We get to look, look at all of those things that have to do with the here and the now. And, and we just get so uptight about all of these things. And I'm telling you, they're superficial. And they will not bring about real change. It's kind of like the man who was asked the question, he says... What color is your wife's hair today? Or what color is your wife's hair? And he said, I don't know. I haven't been home today. And she changed it. So the next question that was asked is, well, if her hair color is different, will there be anything different at home? And he says, no, same old woman. No change. I had a friend for many, many years, now deceased, to admitted to me late in life, he says, you know, I thought if I had a new automobile all the time, I would be okay. But he says, I finally figured out the substance it belongs to Christ. And if you look at the scriptures long enough, you come to understand that what God wants to do is he wants to change you. He wants to change you. <coughs> <clears throat> into his likeness. But I see far too many of us resisting that change. And it's because we're overwhelmed by the superficial. And even though we intellectually know that the substance belongs to Christ, we don't allow the substance to rule in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives. The Apostle Paul is going to say to us, Making substantial change begins with looking from the correct perspective. And so I ask you today, how do you look at things in this life? How do you look at these things in this life? Do you look at it from the outward perspective or do you look at it from the inward man? We want to begin by going back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 beginning in verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, Paul says, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Skipping verse 17, going to verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We don't look at the things that are temporal. We look at the things which are not seen, which are eternal. And Paul gets us to the point where if we want to change and if we want to have true substance working in our lives, we're going to look at it from a totally different perspective. And the outward is going to become non-important and the inward is going to become absolutely important. We're going to look at the heart and the soul and the inward part of man. And we're going to make our changes so that we become like Christ. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that? We could spend our time looking at all that 2 Corinthians chapter 5 has to say to us, but I would like to suggest to you that Paul gives us a very good answer beginning in verse 14 that we're going to be looking at for the next several weeks. The Apostle Paul says that there's got to be an inward change and that first inward change that we need is we need a new spiritual operating system. I've got to admit to you I love my iPhone, that old external 
thing. I love it because it's become my brains, literally. I mean, I, I write notes in it. I use the calendar so that I don't forget appointments. That is, if I can remember to put them into the calendar so that I can set the alarm so that it'll go off, tell me two hours before that I'm supposed to meet with you. I, I like that thing, but I've noticed that they're always trying to improve it. They're always trying to make changes to it. And so every now and then I'll get this little, little message that says there is a new operating system available. You need to update your phone. Spiritually speaking, there has always been just one operating system for the Christian. But what we need to be reminded of is that we constantly are needing to go back to that operating system spiritually so that we can allow the newness which Christ wants us to have, the change that he wants to bring about in our life, to happen. And so it is, we look at verse 14 and following, and what does the Apostle Paul say to us? He says, for the love of Christ controls us. That's the new operating system. The love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. This particular passage of Scripture is totally in antithesis to everything that our world projects. Every message that you get in this world is that it's all about you and all about your needs and all about your desires and all about your whims and all about the way you look at things. And consequently, we find ourselves very, very miserable because we're constantly in conflict because what I want and what you want are not the same thing. But if you want to make a difference in your life, you, you grab a hold of the new operating system, and that new operating system begins to make that difference in your life. And what is it? It's the love of Christ. And so the love of Christ begins to control us. We see that Jesus died for us, and since he died for us, we don't live for ourselves. We let the love that Christ has for us live within us. And so when we find someone in this world who needs a little mercy, instead of being caustic about them because they don't fit into our current operating system, we let the love of Christ control us. Notice what John says. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. Stop and think about these words for just a few moments. Stop and think about what Jesus really did for us. <clears throat> He went to the cross after having come to the earth and being treated miserably. Ultimately, the ultimate humiliation. That's God's love. God literally sent himself. Colossian writer tells us he's the, he's the visible representation of the invisible God. We, we can know what God is like when we look at Christ. And so he's there suspended on a cross. And he looks down at those who put him on that cross and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's love. That's sacrificial love. That's, that's getting out of self and getting into a right relationship with Christ. And the new operating system that you and I need is the operating system in which we let the love that God has shown to us become the love that we operate with. God sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, John continues, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The new operating system that God has for us in our hearts and our lives is that we let the love of Christ control us. But I want to suggest to you that this is something that is very tangible. It's something that can be tangibly de demonstrated. I was thinking about this when we were in our vacation Bible school and we were studying in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, it, it gets down to, to after the man has been let down <coughs> in front of Jesus. Jesus makes this small statement that I thought was most significant. He saw their faith. One of the problems that some of us have is that we do not realize that if we are being Christ and if we are letting the love of Christ work in our lives and work in our, 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 our inward man, it is something that is going to be tangibly seen by those that we come in contact with. It's not something that's just, oh, I love you. No, you can see that love. A new commandment I give to you, that's what Jesus says. That you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. How are they going to know that, that we are the disciple of Christ if you have love for one another? It's tangible. So you and I need a new operating system. But then secondly, in our inward change, we need new software. I know that parts of this sermon are not getting through to some of y'all because you're not computer savvy at all. When I first, first saw my first computer, I thought, that's just a box. I, and that's all it was. I didn't realize that there was an operating system in there and that there was software that went with it that allowed the operating system to do things. Software is very important. One of the things that I've discovered over the years is you don't want to get too far behind on your software. You want to keep it a little bit current. The other day I was trying to open up a document and I couldn't figure out why in the world can I not open up this document? And it was because I had made the document back in 1998 or 99 and the software no longer works. It wouldn't open it up. One of the reasons why we're not changed to the likeness of Christ is because we haven't realized the importance of the new software that needs to be in our lives. The fact that that which is going to allow us to function and be what Christ wants us to be needs to be deeply ingrained within us. What do the scriptures say? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, here's the new software. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. The old things are passed away. The new things are come. Are you living in newness? Or are you living in oldness? Are you living with the power of Christ working in your life? Because you have become the new creature? Or are you still trying to operate with something that's no longer operational? I'm afraid that far too many people have not accepted and are not using the newness which they ought to have in Christ Jesus. I'd like to remind you of some words that are most familiar to most of us, but words that I think are so very important for us to keep on the very, very forefront of our hearts and our minds at all times. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. When we went into that watery grave, when we were buried with Christ in baptism, if that's the case in your life and my life, and we were raised out of that watery grave, the old man was gone. The new man 
should have been working within our heart, within our life. Are you walking in newness? Are you walking in newness? You see, there's got to be a transformation in this process. It's something that you and I have got to be constantly involved in. Listen carefully to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, the old software, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. Put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. To be like God in true righteousness and holiness, putting off the old man and allowing the new man to come forth. A beggar lived near the king's palace. One day he saw a proclamation posting outside the palace gate. The king was giving a great dinner. Anyone dressed in royal garments was invited to the party. The beggar went on his way. He looked at the rags he was wearing and he sighed. Surely only kings and their families wore royal robes, he thought. But slowly an idea crept into his mind. The audacity of it made him tremble. Would he dare... He made his way back to the palace, and he approached the guard at the gate. Please, sire, I would like to speak to the king. Wait here, the guard replied, and in a few minutes he was back. His majesty will see you, he said, and he led the beggar in. You wish to see me, asked the king. Yes, your majesty. I want so much to attend the banquet, but I have no royal robes to wear. Please, sir, if I may be so bold, may I have one of your old garments so that I too may come to the banquet? The beggar shook so hard that he could not see the faint smile that was on the king's face. You have been wise in coming to me, the king said. He called his son the young prince. Take this man to your room and array him in some of your clothes. The prince did as he was told. And soon the beggar was standing before the mirror clothed in garments that he had never dared hope for. You are now eligible to attend the king's banquet tomorrow night, said the prince. But even more important, you will never need any other clothes these garments will last forever. The beggar dropped to his knees. Oh, thank you, he cried. But as he started to leave, he looked back at his pile of dirty rags on the floor, and he hesitated. What if the prince was wrong? What if he would need his old clothes again? Quickly, he gathered them up. The banquet was far greater than he had ever imagined. But he could not enjoy himself as he should. He had made a small bundle of his old rags and it kept falling off of his lap. The food was passed quickly. The beggar missed some of the greatest delicacies. Time proved, though, that the prince was right. The clothes lasted forever. Still the poor beggar grew fonder and fonder of his old rags. As, as time passed, people seemed to forget the royal robes he was wearing. They saw only the little bundle of filthy rags that he clung to wherever he went. They even spoke of him as the old man with the rags. One day as he lay dying, the king visited him. The beggar saw that the king looked sad when he looked at the small bundle of rags by the bed, suddenly the beggar remembered the prince's words and he realized that his bundle of rags had cost him a lifetime of true royalty. If any man 
is in Christ, there's a new creature. The old man has passed away. Maybe as a Christian, you've been carrying that bundle of old rags. I'm going to confess to you that I know that I have. And I'm trying to get rid of them every day. Without the love of Christ controlling us, and without the newness in Christ Jesus, there's absolutely no possibility of any change. But if we put away the old, and we live in the new. The newness of life that Christ has promised to us becomes us. And that abundance of life that he tells us that he wants us to have, it's ours. Do you need to make a change in your life today? Maybe you do. Maybe as a Christian you need to change the course of your life. Get rid of the old rags. There may be someone here today who's never become a Christian, who's, who, who's never become Christ. You've never been buried with Christ in that watery grave to be raised to walk in that newness of life we talked about a few moments ago. We're ready for you this morning. The baptistry is ready. The clothes are ready. If you want a new set of clothes, you can have them. For when we're baptized with Christ, the Galatian writer tells us, chapter 3, we're clothed with him. Can we help you this morning? We extend the invitation of Christ. If there's some need that you have, come and give me your hand, but give God your heart. We'll help you to become what Jesus wants you to be as we stand and as we sing.